Well, good evening, ladies. I cannot tell you how much I simply miss you. I miss you with my whole heart. I miss getting hugs and I miss your beautiful faces and I miss your smiles and your words of encouragement. And so I just simply miss you. So I thought I was gonna just video this and then have you just be able to go on in your free time or whatever to, um, to just listen. But with the live streaming up and Rhonda and Zach and Pastor Phil, we're all okay with us doing this live stream. So here I am, but I, I just want you to know how much I love you and miss you. Um, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, one is that Lord willing, um, if we are not together, together <laughs> um, again at church physically, then we'll go ahead and live stream our next study, which is our last in the book of, in this chapter, Proverbs 31, um, uh, May 4th. So we'll be doing this again live stream May 4th, if we're not together. My prayer is that we will be. Um, the other thing is please don't miss the live stream for Good Friday service at 7 and then of course Resurrection Sunday and um, it's my understanding I think Pastor Phil sent an out update up out and he um, is going to I think even have communion so you might want to get some communion elements ready in your home and if you don't have grape juice that's okay any type of juice what anything to represent and remember that's why we do it we do it in remembrance of him so you might want to have that ready for you, um, for you guys on Friday night. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is with my beautiful women from Calvary Elk Grove and anyone else who may be joining, um, some of you know this, some of you may not, we're going to stop and pray in a second for someone who is a dear, beautiful woman in our church. Her name is Marianne Cruz, and Marianne was a first service person, so some of the second service person people may not know Mary Ann, but um, you may know her husband because um, Lucio does our sound with our sound team. He serves faithfully in, our, in that ministry. And um, Mary Ann um, is, a healthcare, was a health, is a healthcare person, but she right now is in ICU and she's very critical. Um, she has tested positive for COVID-19. Um, her, her kidneys have, are starting to shut down. They think she has sepsis. Um, and she loves the Lord and knows the Lord. But I want us to do together before we begin the study to pray over her and her family. Father God, we lift up Mary Ann to you, Lord. And Lord, we love her. And selfishly, we don't want to see her leave this earth and leave us. And so, Father, we pray, if it be your will, that you would spare her life. That you, O oh Lord, would um, just, in, in the name of Jesus, spare her, Father, of this COVID-19 and clear her lungs and uh, cause her kidneys to work right. And, and Lord, I just pray, Lord, over her husband, Lucio, that you will keep him from getting this virus and her family and friends and her sister, Barbara Pauls, who I know and love dearly. Father, just I pray over that whole family that you would give them wisdom and comfort and healing in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. All right, ladies, we um, are living in a very unprecedented time. And part of me was like, do I go through the verses where we are in Proverbs 31? Or do I do a different type of study? And I felt like the Lord said, you are going through verses 21 through 26 for such a time as this. And so I want to be obedient to what I feel he told me, and we're just going to go ahead and go through those verses. I'm going to read those verses to you, and then I'm just going to start to expound. Um, Proverbs 31, verses uh, 21 through 26 says, She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself, and her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates, and when he sits among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Well, Proverbs 
uh, 31, verse 21, reads, She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. Now, the Amplified Bible, which is the... Um, it just amplifies the Greek meaning of the verses. Um, it reads this way. She fears not the snow for her family, for all her household are doubly clothed in scarlet. I was thinking about this verse, and I was thinking about you, and I was thinking about me. And it can very well read, she is not afraid of COVID-19, for her household, for her household is clothed with scarlet. We ladies must be prepared for the storms in our life. We must be prepared for the bad weather, the emergencies, and I mean, even like spiritually, but physically as well with water and canned food and protein bars and drinks and batteries and radios, if we need be blankets, flashlights, all those things, our preparations will give to our family a, um, a secure feeling they will be secure knowing that they are well cared for and that we, as the moms, as the wives, have, have prepared. This verse is speaking of the virtue of preparation and she prepares for the future with wisdom and willingness. Now she not only prepares and provides food like we saw in verse 14, but clothing as well. And in the winter, her family is clothed with scarlet. Well, scarlet's very interesting. It is in the Old Testament, scarlet thread was used for these things. It was used for offerings in the sanctuary and tabernacle, materials in the tabernacle, in making priestly garments. It was used in the ritual for cleansing healed lepers. It was used in purification. Scarlet cord was used by Rahab the harlot to hide those spies, if you remember, as a sign of the promise made between them. And Saul clothed his daughters, the daughters of Israel, with scarlet in luxury. Scarlet represents the best of the best. The Proverbs 31 woman saved the best of the best for her family and her household, and she clothed them in healing, in promise, in purification and sanctification. And her foremost concern for her family was to be clothed in the Lord, the God of Israel, and the things of the God of Israel. You know, preparation, I do believe, is very important to God, whose name is actually Jehovah Jireh, the God who will provide. He is the one in whom we can totally rely on and totally depend on. When we work to provide clothing and other necessities, when we prepare to meet our family's future needs, these are actions, and these actions speak forth messages of love to them. She was prepared, ladies, in the stormy times and in emergencies, and it seems like she did not run out of things. She thought through what her family needed, and she planned ahead of time. Now, some of you may not be planners. In fact, some of you may just not have that gift, and that's okay. God always provides. He knows. He knows our weaknesses, our shortcomings. You, you know, you might be sitting there feeling, oh, I didn't, I didn't plan for COVID-19. Well, I've got news for you. Nobody planned for COVID-19, so don't worry about that. You know, but if you can, at all possible, pray about being more prepared for your family. So when I hear of a snowstorm coming, what do I do immediately do? I do a house check. I go to the store and a few days before that storm, if I could, I, I do pick up things just in case electric goes out, storm goes out, you know, brings things out, internet out. Um, before we were sent home from work to work remotely in our homes, um, a couple days ahead of that, it was our last Sunday at church. I remember going out after service when we were together and going to the Walmart and to the Jewel and, and finding and kind of prepping. So we, you know, we see that this is a practical thing that the Proverbs 31 did. The need, we need not fear, ladies, the storms, because we have the God of Israel. We have Jesus, and he is with us. You know, her family, it states in this verse, um, didn't fear the storm because they were kept actually warm. And we have been focusing right now on the physical, but 
Let's talk about the spiritual. Were you ready for the storm that we find ourselves in, in COVID-19? Were you ready for it spiritually? Was your family ready for it? Were your children ready for it? Are you developing a strong relationship with Jesus like right now? Right now. Are you storing up promises of his words right now as we are in this storm? Because as we do that, the word comes out in our hearts and our minds. And we're able to give it to our, our close dear friends and our family and our children. Isaiah 55, 6 is a verse that <laughs> reminds me of the old Praise 2 album. It was a song that when I first got saved uh, was something we sang. And said, See, it says, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. And the Amplified reads this, seek, inquire for, and require the Lord while he may be found, claiming him by necessity and by right. Call upon him while he is near. Are you spiritually prepared for the trials that may come, for the temptations that may hit at your doorstep or the storms? Is your family, your children spiritually strong and prepared for the trials and the temptations and the storms? Now is the time. We are here for such a time as this. Verse 22, we see that this woman of valor made tapestry for herself and her clothing. Again, it's mentioned, and I think it's really awesome how the Holy Spirit specifically mentions fine linen and purple in verse 22. The Amplified reads this way, she makes for herself coverlets and cushions and rugs of tapestry. Her clothing is of linen, pure and fine, and of purple, such as that of which the clothing of the priests and the hallowed cloths of the temple were made. The emphasis here is really not about wealth and luxury. Don't miss this. It is not. It is about care and beauty and time spent caring for your home, your family, yourself even. You know, I find in this verse that it is really okay to want to improve the beauty of our homes as long as we do it within our budgets, right? And, you know, along with what our husbands would like, I think that it, it's we're actually called to be that. We're called to have that interest in our homes. The first part of this verse, though, refers to furnishings. In fact, a covering of tapestry has been translated. And as I have read from the Amplified Bible, it talks about carpets and woven coverlets for, your bed, for her bed, upholstery, and quilts. We need to care for our homes and ourselves, and we need to take a little time caring just for us. And I believe that the Lord even in the madness of what we are living in this COVID-19 and shelter at home and uh, uh, safe uh, spatial distancing or social distancing, and all those things that we're living in right now. I mean, our nation's shut down. Um, every non-essential business is shut down and we find ourselves at home. And I feel like that the Lord is using that you know how he uses even the bad things that happen for good? I believe that's what he's doing in this situation. And we are to care for ourselves. That means we are to be filled up in Jesus and in the word of God. We represent the king of glory in the way we dress, in the way we look, in the way we um, respond, in the way we react. <laughs> We are always representing the King of Glory. And this woman, her clothing was a fine linen and purple. Her clothing reflected excellent standards. And we are, clothed, we are to clothe ourselves with the utmost excellent standard. And again, I don't mean purchasing extravagant, extravagantly priced items. I'm speaking of God's standards, of what he's laid out in this amazing word of God. Um, even though her character is, her clothing here is referring, we think on the, on the look of it, that it's referring to um, like her physical clothing. And very well may be, but I also 
um, believe that it is reflecting her character. But for the, just for a moment, I would like to focus on the outward clothing. And I think we did last time as I was reading these notes and I was thinking over these, but I just felt like I needed to repeat just a little bit of this. Um, as godly women, and how are we supposed to appear? to those around us. Um, 1 Timothy 2.9 says this, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is, pros which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. The Amplified reads this way, also, I desire that women should adorn themselves modestly and appropriately and sensibly in seeming, seemly apparel, not with elaborate hair arrangement or gold or pearls or expensive clothing, but by doing good deeds, deeds in themselves good, and for the good and advantage of those con contact, contacted, contacted by them, that's a weird word, um, those in contact with them, I think is what the Greek means, as befits women who profess reverential fear and devotion to God. Titus 2.5 reads, be discreet, be chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to your own husband, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. And can I just stop here and just do a little disclaimer in our last study, I talked a lot about submission to your husbands, and that is what our call is as women of God. Um, we are to submit to our husbands. They are the head of our homes. They are the ones that God has placed in authority. That's why I don't teach the Bible to men. I teach just to the women. And But um, I do want to do a disclaimer. Um, you are to obey your husband unto godliness. What do I mean by that? Well, your husband may not be someone who has made a personal commitment to the Lord, um, and he may ask you to do something very ungodly, maybe to watch pornography or something of that nature. Um, I would hope that you would know that that is not something you should submit to because it is not unto the Lord. You know, he's not asking you to do something as un uh, that's not as unto the Lord. So um, I wanted to put that out to you because last time I didn't say that. I just was going on about submission to our homes, which is what we're called to do um, as women of God. Um, so let me go back and look at some of the words that are in these verses, talking about the way we are to dress. Uh, modesty is a word that we see. And what does it mean? Well, it's observing the conventions of decency. Modesty is standard, and we need to cover up. Remember I said that last time? I don't know what modesty means to you. What modesty means to you might be totally different than what modesty means to me. All I know is we need to cover up, and we must dress decently and holy. We don't want to cause anyone to stumble. Soberness is another word we see in these verses, and it's dressing in a proper and sensible manner. Moderation is wearing neither too much nor too little. Discretion is showing good judgment and taste. Chaste is, it reflects a relationship with God. Our loving Jesus is concerned about our outward clothing as we, and we should be, because again, we are reflecting the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And can people see us? First thing they notice is our appearance, and we want to make sure that our appearance is a, in, in a godly fashion. Now, our loving Jesus is also concerned about the clothing of our heart. In fact, it is at the um, higher concern that he has. He is more concerned with what clothes your and my heart than our physical bodies. First Peter 3, 3 and 4 says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging of the hair, wearing of gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with an incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. In the Amplified, those verses read this way. Let not yours be merely external adorning with elaborate inner weaving and knotting of your hair and the wearing of jewelry or changes of clothes. Now, 
Can I stop there and say that braiding your hair and wearing pretty clothes and it, it, that's not wrong. <laughs> what, what the verse is going to say next is what is the most weightier piece. So let that not be your only concern or your merely your concern, but let it be the inward adorning and beauty of the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible and unfading charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit, which is not anxious or wrought up, but is very precious in the sight of God. Oh, how sweet that the Holy Spirit lists these two specific pieces that the Proverbs 31 clothes herself with fine linen and purple because there's a rich spiritual meaning behind these two. Revelation 19 8 reads this way, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Revelation 9 in the Amplified, she has been permitted to dress in fine radiant linen dazzling and white i love that dazzling because i'm a bling girl you guys the, all that know me know that dazzling and white for the fine linen is signifies and represents the righteous the upright just and godly living deeds and conduct and right standing with god of the saints god's holy people so we see the Proverbs 31 woman is upright and just and lives in a, lives a godly life. Her deeds and her conduct are in right standing with God, as so should ours be. The fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. The bride of Christ wears fine linen. In Revelation 19, 13 through 14, it reads, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and again, the Amplified reads, dazzling and clean, clean, followed him on white horses. We see in 2 Samuel chapter 6, when David was bringing the Ark of God to Jerusalem, in this portion of scripture, it was the second time when it was done the right way, he was clothed in linen representing uprightness. And then we see she is got she's clothed in linen and purple. The purple represents royalty and wealth. It was very expensive and it represented the finest quality. Ladies, once we are saved, we are clothed with Christ's garments of righteousness and we are adorned decorated with, beautified by, and enhanced by Jesus's purity, his worthiness, and we are now royal daughters of the King. We are witnesses and representatives of the Lord. We are his ambassadors. And what matters most is not that we have a model face or a model body, but that we model Christ likeness to our loved ones, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, and our church family. Does your appearance portray the character of God? Have you developed the holiness and righteousness of God in your life? And when you do, it will cause the loveliness of Jesus to shine through your eyes. I think about that. I can always tell when I'm talking with someone that they have Jesus, because when we're talking about something, I could see the compassion right through their eyes. I could see a softness, a concern in their eyes. And it has been said that the eyes are a window to our souls and oh, to be clothed in Jesus. And we are. You and I, we have been clothed in white linen, those robes of righteousness which we don't deserve. We are unworthy to have, but when we acknowledged ourselves as a sinner and we gave our lives over to Jesus, realizing that he went to the cross, that his blood was shed for my sins and your sins, when you come to terms with that and you fall face down, and broken, and giving your heart and your life to Jesus, you are now clothed in the white robe of righteousness, and it was nothing you did. It's all his. He clothes us in that white robe. Well, verse 23, I love this. It says that her husband is known in the gates, and when he sits among the elders of the land, 
Well, the Amplified is a, got just a little more meaning. It says her husband is known in the city gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Now the gates here in this verse is a place where legal decisions were made, a place of prominence. And I see that she served her husband in such a way that he was able to excel in the position God had placed him in. The word teaches us that one of the most important roles that a wife holds in the marriage covenant, it's one of them, is to support her husband. Genesis 2.18 reads, The Lord God said it is not good that man should be alone, and I will make him a helper comparable to him. And the Amplified reads, The Lord God said it is not good or sufficient or satisfactory that the man should be alone, and I will make him a helper meet, suitable, adapted, complementary for him. You see, this noble wife of Proverbs 31 certainly knew that pouring her soul into helping her husband would enable him to become a man of great influence right where God had him. He doesn't have to be in ministry. He doesn't have to be a man who teaches the word of God or serves in the church. He may be a man who's called to a work um, position in the world, but you as a woman of God are called to pour your heart and soul into helping him and enabling him to become a man of great influence. Do you realize that you have an amazing influence on your husband's success and call on his life? Your influence affects his work, your children's attitude and respect for him, and with, and with the way that um, your influence is to your family, to the friends around you. How you share who he is, is how people will view him. It is so important that we ladies are always um, have a heart that wants to help our husband and reflect him accurately to those around us. I love this um, story. You all know I love Charles Spurgeon and his writings, but Susanna Spurgeon, the wife of Charles Spurgeon, and Charles Spurgeon, by the way, was known as the Prince of Preachers, knew that she could be a blessing to him. It had been told that at a time that Charles' ministry was thriving, he became concerned that Mimi, he was neglecting his children. And I want to stop there. You know, I do think that your husband may not tell you that, but I think that sometimes our husbands, they work so hard and they're out there and they feel bad for the things maybe that they aren't able to do in the home because of working so hard. So, and so in, in this case, Charles Spurgeon did, and he was serving the Lord and he was preaching. One evening, Charles Spurgeon returned home earlier than usual from where he was ministering. And upon entering his home and opening the door, to his surprise, none of the children were in the hallway. Ascending the stairs, he heard his wife's voice. As he was ascending, he heard it clearer and clearer and clearer. And he knew when he reached the top, she was praying with the children. One by one, she lifted them before God's throne. And when she finished her prayer and her nightly instructions to her little ones, Spurgeon thought, I can go on with my work. My children are well cared for. You see, because of Susanna's faithfulness and diligence, Mrs. Spurgeon, Susanna, enabled Charles to continue to stir and convict hearts for the kingdom of God. Can your husband do what he needs to do because he knows that the home is taken care of and the children are well cared for? You see, the Proverbs 31 woman's husband, he can sit in the gates because he knew that his children and his home were being well cared for. And ladies, I truly believe that if you are a mom with young children, if at all possible, and believe me, I have had many people really be upset with me for saying this, but I'm going to say it. If at all possible, you should be home with them. I truly believe that if you have young children and you are working outside the house, you should have a definite confirmation of divine guidance to do so. Now, some of you may be single moms and you can't help that. But for the most part, if you could, 
be at home with your children. We need to get two things back in the home and we need to do it really fast. The word of God and the mom. And when we work outside of the home, we return worn out with little, very little left to give. When children come home from school, no matter what their age is, whether they're little, whether they're uh, teenagers, even college students, I mean, they need to find somebody home, parents home. I don't know if many, you know, there's so many things going on um, over Facebook and different things about COVID-19 and the, what we're living in. And I thought that this really applied to what I'm saying here. And I'm gonna read it to you. It says, pay attention folks, traffic is gone, gas is affordable, bills are extended, kids are at home with their families, parents are home taking care of their children, fast food has been replaced by home cooked meals, hectic schedules replaced by naps. The air seems cleaner and the world quieter. People are conscious about hygiene and health again. We finally listen to authorities and head home when they say so. Money doesn't seem to make the world go round anymore. And we now have time, finally, to stop and smell the roses. And lastly, and most importantly, we become closer to God and more evidently praising him every day of our lives. And it seems like this COVID-19 is a reset button on humanity. And you know, we find ourselves in a very scary time and we can at times be very anxious and just bottled up with fear. But ladies, God can do a good thing in this. And part of it is that we're home with our families. Pray and ask God to help you support your husband in ways that will strengthen him to glorify God in the ways that maybe you just haven't seen before now. Ask God to show you something new that you can do. May you do good for your husband and not evil all the days of your life by helping him, encouraging him, nurturing your marriage, supporting his dreams, praying for his successes, that he may be a man of godly influence in his work and community. Again, our influence toward our husband, husbands can be for good or for bad. We must be an intercessor for them. We are to intercede for our husbands daily before God, asking God to make him all that he needs to be for Jesus and to help us be a wife who blesses his life. And we need to let him be a man. We're not to control him or try to manipulate him to control him because with women, we can do that. We just need to let him be the man and we are to be the helpmate and that's just how God designed it. And when we do, we, our marriages are blessed. We are to have a spiritual ambition to let our husbands be all that God has called them to be. What an influence we have on our husbands. May we be faithful, helpful, loyal, prayerful, loving, physically and emotionally, godly, righteous and supporting. And when we do, he will have every opportunity to be the best at what God wants him to be. Verse 24, Proverbs uh, 31, 24, she makes linen garment, garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. This is a real interesting verse. Um, it's in the Amplified, it reads, she makes fine garments and leads others to buy them. And she delivers to the merchants girdles or sashes that free one up for service. She makes items and she sells them and she supplies them for other people. She's a very diligent, hardworking woman and she has others' best interests at heart. She looks for a way to make others' lives easier. The quality of her goods were excellent. And I love this because sometimes we think that we need to settle for less than the best in order to be like good stewards of God's money. And most of the time that is true, but not always. These were valuable garments. In fact, they uh, these garments are referred to here, um, these like, they are wide flowing undergarments of linen worn close to the body. So she did this and as a help meet to her husband financially. She is not a drain on the family finances. Rather, 
Rather than being at a drain, she is industrious. Um, Gill's commentary reads this way. She not only seeks wool and flax and spins it, remember we touched on that last study, but makes it up into fine linen, which she disposes of to advantage to her, her, herself and her family. And then she delivers the sashes or girdles unto the merchants to dispose of them for her, either to sell to others or to the Egyptian priests which wore them, or for their own use, to put their money in, girdles being used for the purpose, for that purpose. So we see in the New Testament, Priscilla made tents by her husband's side, and Lydia was a seller of purple. And so we know it's not wrong for women to make money but their primary responsibilities are to be the keepers of the home. And you may or may not work with your hands, or you may or may not be able to help out financially. This is the point of this verse. The point is here is that she's not a financial drain on her husband. She is an aid and a help to him financially because she stays within the budget. Well, she she's blessed and she's able to you know, make these things and sell them. You may not be, that may not be what God wants you to do or has, you know, fit you to do or created you to do. But the point is not to be a financial drain. And that's a help to our husbands. So verse 25, strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. Amplified reads, strength and dignity are her clothing, and her position is strong and secure. She rejoices over the future, the latter day or time to come, knowing that she and her family are in readiness for it. When we clothe ourselves with strength and dignity of our God, and that's the only way we can, is through him. I am weak, but he is strong. I have shortcomings, but he does not. He is a God of dignity when at times I am not. But he clothes you and I with strength and dignity. And we will be able to rejoice in future joys and sorrows because we have established our strength and our dignity on the hope that we have Jesus and the promises of his word. Psalm 23 verses 1 and 2 reads, The Lord is my shepherd. To feed and guide and shield me, and I shall not lack. He makes me lie down in fresh, tender green pastures, and he leads me besides the still and restful waters. Jeremiah 29, 11 and 13 through 13 read, For I know the thoughts and the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil, to give you a hope in your final outcome. Then you will call upon me, and you will come and pray to me, and I will hear and heed you. And then you will seek me, inquire for, and require me as a vital necessity. And find me when you search for me with all your heart. I don't know about you, but he is my vital necessity. Through the fears that I um, have through COVID-19 and the tragedies and the sorrows that we see on the news constantly and the people around us and our neighbors and all the things that we are in contact with. I need him as my vital necessity. He is my vital necessity. I am leaning into him more than I ever have before. I feel broken before him. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 32, which I'm not going to read. You can maybe write that down and read it later. And Colossians 3, 8 through 17, that we are to put on godliness. And in the same way that we put clothes on, God is calling us to wear the garment of his godly character. The Proverbs 31 woman puts on strength and dignity, strength in every way she clothes herself with strength her mind, her spirit, her physical body, and dignity. The literal Hebrew translation is splendor. This encompasses the way she acts and conducts herself, the way she speaks and dresses, and all that she is is touched with the beauty of dignity. As a result of this, she has hope. Clothed and robed in such virtuous splendor, this woman rejoices or literally laughs at the future 
as we can as well. Being able to rejoice in the future requires clothing ourselves with the garment of strength and the ornament of dignity and the robe of faith. Purpose to daily put on the virtues of strength and dignity, which these are rooted in our knowledge of the Heavenly Father. We can live in constant peace in the midst of COVID-19. We can live in constant peace of mind from a secure confidence in God's gracious providence. Again, that he has placed us here for such a time as this. And finally, verse 26, it says that she opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. And I wanna remind you, and I think I've reminded you every study we've had, that this woman is not real. This is the woman that Lemuel's mom wanted him to find. So this is not a woman. She doesn't like, you, you don't have to attain all of this. But there is something through these verses that God may just jump and leap out at you. And it's something that you need to just work on with him. But in Proverbs 31, 26 in the Amplified, it reads, She opens her mouth in skillful and godly wisdom, and on her tongue, tongue is the law of kindness, or giving counsel and instruction. You know, we find ourselves in the house now, 24-7. Some of you have been there. You know, some of you have the little ones and you're home and you're taking care of them and you don't leave much. <laughs> but a lot of us have been made to be at home and here we all find ourselves at home with one another. And I couldn't think of a more timely admonition as this verse, opening our mouths with wisdom and on our tongue, speaking the law of kindness. Wisdom, ladies, and kindness go hand in hand. You know how I sometimes refer to peace and mercy and how they're best friends. They're, they go hand in hand, skipping along the way. Well, that's wisdom and kindness. They're best friends. And they are hand in hand, skipping along the way. Wisdom given without kindness is rarely, rarely received. And kindness given without wisdom is not worth much. Webster defines kindness as of sympathetic, forbearing, or pleasant nature, benevolent. Wisdom is about what you say. Kindness is how you say it. Do you need wisdom? I know I do. We need to run to God in prayer and run to the Word of God, which has all wisdom and knowledge. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If we ask God for wisdom, he will give it to us. Proverbs 10, 19 says, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Proverbs 12, 18 reads, There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Proverbs 16.21 says, The wise in heart will be called prudent, and sweetness of the lips increases learning. Godly speech brings forth emotional healing. Speaking words of wisdom and kindness is like a fountain in the desert. They both give life. There are so many people walking around who wear brave smiles, but they are hurting and they are stressed and they are struggling. Oh, how we need to go to the word and speak forth wisdom. Proverbs 14 says, says that the heart knows its own bitterness and a stranger does not share its joy. Proverbs 14, 13 says, even in laughter, the heart may sorrow and in the end of mirth may be grief. Ask the Lord to use you to refresh and encourage everyone you encounter with life giving words, words that are wise and words that are kind. Especially again, as we are sheltered at home, many of us have been forced to be with family for 24-7, right? May we 
pour our souls into our family at this time. And if you are single or widowed and you are living alone, pour yourself into the Lord. Ask the Lord to give you words of wisdom that you can text to your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your church family. Be an encourager with your words to your husband and your children and to all around you. You know, I've made it a practice to ask the Lord anytime I'm going anywhere when I'm going to be around people that he would give me a word of encouragement for at least one person. And I do this especially when I'm on my way to church to be with everyone, our, our beautiful church family. Um, but I've been doing that now, like as the Lord puts someone on my heart here at home, I'll, I'll text a word of encouragement. Um, and you can do the same. Um, kind words, it's been said, and I love this quote, I've quoted it before. Kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. They're truly endless. endless. I'm just going to end with reading a few more scriptures about speech. Ephesians 4.25 says this, put away lying. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt word, swearing, coarse, or vulgar joking proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Ephesians 4.31 and 32, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Luke 6, 45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Proverbs 4, 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs forth the issues of life. Ladies, we must acquire the fear of the Lord in our lives. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and it will produce in us wisdom and the law of kindness. In Amy Carmichael's book, If, she journals. And again, If is just a little book, and we've offered this many times over the years, that speaks of Calvary love. It's that agape love. It's that all dying love that Jesus gave us. It speaks of a dying to self kind of love. And she said, if I can write an unkind letter or speak an unkind word, if I can think an unkind thought without grief and shame, then I know nothing of Calvary love. Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil and er pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. Two more scriptures. Proverbs 9.10 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Remember that wisdom in the law of kindness written on our hearts as we absorb the word of God and his love and his character as we gain his heart beat um, through the word of God, as we remember that we write it on our hearts, it will show itself on our tongues. What we put in our hearts comes forth out of our mouths. Ladies, we will only be as wise as we are holy, and we will only be as holy as we develop a fear of the Lord in our lives, our personal lives, you and me, um, alone with God, one-on-one -on -one with Him, doing business with Him, laying out our hearts before Him. We will only be as holy as we develop a fear of the Lord in our lives in which we will look more closely at the next time we come together, whether it be through live streaming <laughs> or whether we come together again, which I 
long for as a church body. We're going to study the fear of the Lord as we end this wonderful, amazing chapter and study in this, this wonderful chapter of Proverbs 31. I'm going to close with this before I pray. I was sharing with some of the ladies on March 15th was our last um, Sunday together. And um, I remember we no one was hugging. We were doing elbow, you know, hits and we were doing spatial distancing and stuff. And, and so, and um, I just remember sharing with a few of the women that um, it felt like, you know how when you have a little baby, when you first have a little baby, or if you've never had a child when you're holding a little baby, but you're super sick with the flu. So you've got a runny nose and you've got the cough and the sneezing going on and you can't kiss the baby. You could be near the baby, but you can't kiss the baby. And I kind of felt like that with my grandchildren over the last few weeks, you know, can be near them maybe, but I couldn't, you know, kiss. At least I didn't want to. And, um, it's just that longing, you know, to, to show that and to, to, to love. And um, that's how I feel with our church family. You know, it was like, oh, I couldn't give them a hug. <laughs> we decided we're a huggy church, right? And uh, we're going to have to change a little of that, I think, after learning what we've been through through this. But I want you to know I have loved this time with you. And I pray that you will take what what has been spoken and don't get overwhelmed with it. Don't get condemned by it. I hope you're convicted by it, but I hope you're not condemned by it. Condemnation is not from God. Only that the sweet conviction of the Holy Spirit which draws you near to his heart. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this amazing study. As we look at this woman of valor, Lord, we want to be women, Lord, who just Put on the garment, Lord, that you um, portray. We want to portray you, Lord. So maybe we be clothed in dignity and strength. And may our, our words be of wisdom. And may the law of kindness be on our tongues, Lord. And may we, may we influence our husband in a godly manner, Lord. And may we enable them to be all that they can be, Father. And and all the things that we went over, we just pray that you be glorified in and through our lives. Oh, how we love you. Lord, um, we turn our eyes upon you and we look into your wonderful face. And when we do, the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and your grace. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you.